Hey everyone, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. Today, we're bringing you a conversation with Rachel Rukert, a really amazing young writer who recently published a memoir called East Winds, A Global Quest to Reckon with Marriage. Rachel's story is a fascinating one. Perhaps due to a highly tumultuous home life as a child, she inherited her suspicions about marriage early. Growing up in the church, there was a constant drumbeat about marriage and eternal families, but those lessons always seemed to raise more questions for her than they did answers. Eventually, Rachel met her husband-to-be, Austin, and soon found herself on the adventure of a lifetime, a year-long backpacking trip on a shoestring budget that would serve as a honeymoon and bring her face-to-face with marriage in its stark reality. In between an escape from rabid dogs in the Amazon, accidentally stumbling upon democracy protests in Hong Kong, and a 500-mile trek through Spain in sandals, Rachel found a way to finally confront her deepest questions. This book is the incredibly insightful and beautifully written result, and we feel lucky to have, in a sense, gone on this journey with her. In our conversation with Rachel, we were able to explore her quest to reckon with marriage, as well as some other fascinating themes in the book. How does one learn to trust their intuition or recognize the spirit? How should life's biggest decisions be made? And at church, or in any community, how can we truly practice being brothers and sisters when we all have such different perspectives? We're so excited to share this conversation with you and are confident in saying that you really need to pick up Rachel's book. It was published by BCC Press and is available online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Thanks, as always, for listening. And with that, we'll jump right into the conversation. All right. Rachel, we're so excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking some time to have this conversation with us. Thank you for having me. It's been so fun to read this book together, and it's been the beginning of so many interesting conversations with each other, but we're really excited to be able to, to bring you into the conversation. So um, I would love to start with the title, East Winds. Could you maybe just talk about your, I mean, your vision for the book, but then also how you settled on this title? Did you know that that's what it was going to be called before you even started? It took me a long time to know that this was actually the title. The book actually took eight years to write. Um, and what it is, is it's a frame story of a year in my life, right when I get married, Austin and I, my, um, my husband, we traveled for a year and I was researching what marriage and wedding symbolism meant in different cultures. And I had an anthropology background, um, but really was what it was about is really wrestling with what it meant in my own experience growing up um, you know, in the LDS tradition and what marriage meant, particularly the eternal marriage and um, having a lot of baggage uh, with that from my own family origin. And so, um, so I always knew like that was the frame story, but what became really important as I kept writing and as the years went by and I kept realizing this wasn't just, you know, a travelogue or anything like that. And I never wanted it to be just that, but I realized that, um, so much of my own upbringing, my own background was essential. And so the title East Winds comes from a weather phenomenon that happens in Davis County, Utah, which is where I grew up. Um, which we had never heard of. I can't believe we didn't know about that. Yeah, no, and like those, you know, for any, inner, you know, Intermountain West folks, even just two years ago, that huge windstorm that came through and just demolished all of mm-hmm. those um, trees, you know, that, that was an east wind storm. And so I don't know if that phrase is used Crazy. as much as it used to be, but um, one of my first memories is standing at the mailbox that's like just been blown out and my parents are chasing it down the road and I'm holding my pigtails because I'm so afraid of blowing away. And so this uh, metaphor of the wind um, Follow, follows my journey, it follows my story as Austin and I are traveling through these different countries um, and flashes back to my own experience and my own fear of my own restless nature in tension with my desire to belong and have community. And so the wind takes on a whole bunch of different um, meanings, but I think so much of the process of writing this book was making sense of the invisible and making it visible to myself. Like wind is an invisible force of change and destruction and many things, but to make it visible to myself was an essential part of of writing this book. Yeah. And maybe could you talk about too, as we sort of like frame, I think it's helpful in the book that you do at near the beginning, sort of talk a lot about your, your background. And you mentioned just now some of the baggage that you had around, uh, around marriage and specifically sort of this Latter-day Saint idea of, of eternal marriage. Could you, and one of the things that you write, I guess, is that you say your family lacked 
when you were young, your family lacked an origin story. So maybe you could talk about what you mean by that and feel free to, you know, share some stories or just like anecdotes from, from your past that you think maybe created some of that, that baggage that you felt as you started to, you know, become an adult and face the prospect of, of your own marriage. Yeah. So I, I had a challenging upbringing um, and you, you never really quite know what the normal is when you're growing up. It's just what I knew. It's just what I knew. My parents really hated each other and d neither of them had even a remotely similar story to the other of like, how did you meet? How did you get married? How, you know, these basic questions that children ask their parents. My dad was largely absentee and depressed for most of their marriage. And my mother, um, though I didn't know her at the time and she has since been diagnosed with a delusional disorder, um, essentially kicked me out of my house when I was 15. Um, because of some of her, her delusions about who I was and what she thought I was up to. And so um, marriage was a terrifying prospect. It, getting married and kind of realizing, and actually the book opens with, I'm, I'm essentially having a panic attack, you know, days after my temple wedding and just like, what have I done? Mm. <laughs> um, and so it felt, but it also felt like something I had to do. Um, and I also found someone I loved that I wanted to share a life with. So I just had all these knots and I didn't have an origin story. Um, what you said, yeah. I didn't have a framework to make sense of, I love this person, why am I freaking out? And oh yeah, you know, even just navigating um, how marriage was taught versus what I experienced and saw, which I was still puzzling through because I was so close to that experience. I think humans create stories to make sense of our lives, especially when it comes to processing trauma. And I think, you know, fortunately for me as a writer, you know, for better or for worse, I had to write this story because I had to essentially create that origin story of like, how did I get here and what did it mean so I can more mindfully navigate my way forward? I think that's so much about what I loved about the whole book is that it, it, on some level, it's the most relatable story, like this, this search of self and 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 also trying to combine trying to find what your identity is going to be like in a partnership you know and and but it seemed like you were doing all of this in a really extreme version of that same process that we all go through and so it was really therapeutic to read it because you were processing the biggest feelings that that also like i 100% recognize in myself but i but you know you were you were on a year long honeymoon and it just felt like such an extreme way to to figure out what that relationship is going to look like. And, and in a way, your childhood was an extreme way to figure out what, what an identity is going to look like with, with all of this turbulence. And so, so even though it was so out of reach for me in a lot of ways, every single thing you're, you're rolling through is so intensely familiar. And so it was, it was, it was really beautiful to go from beginning to end with you because it forces you to, to really think through the hardest, most challenging pain points of our, our own story of like identity and partnership. And so I loved every part of this Russell for you, but I would be really curious. I, there's this part where you talk about um, getting your patriarchal blessing and, and that felt big to me because I think I was also really in search of an identity. And I remember just like hoping so much that in my patriarchal blessing, it would be like crystal clear that he would say, this is your mission. This is what your mm -hmm. life's mission is. Because I think I was so hungry for some kind of identity. And even in, you know, as this young teen, like the, I felt like it was something that had to be given to me. Like, I just didn't even understand that this was something I would have to forge. And so patriarchal blessing was this obsession. Someone's going to tell me who I am and what I'm meant to do. And so I just couldn't, I think your patriarchal blessing story was so incredibly ironic, but also would probably just be the best thing for a kid who is ready to just take in exactly what an authority figure says they're meant to be. So tell us, can you talk about that? Can you talk about your experience getting a patriarchal blessing? Absolutely. Yeah. The great cosmic fortune cookie of we're going to know everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my experience of getting my patriarchal blessing, it was shortly after I had left my mother's house and we had had that, um, that baffling falling out that I just couldn't make heads or tails of. And so I, I was really looking for direction. I was looking for comfort. I was looking for something um, I didn't even know it was like a family event to go get your patriarchal blessing. I just kind of like showed up to the patriarch's house by myself. And I mean, it was scheduled, obviously, but, um, and, um, you know, I had a little bit of small talk and he puts his hands on my head and gives me a blessing. And um, I actually probably have it somewhere on my shelf here right behind me, but um, it, it was a really moving blessing that talked about um, I would be free from fear 
I would travel. It would be a big part of um, my experience. I, you know, would find someone to marry. I'd have, you know, all, all of the things basically. And um, the blessing ends. I leap up off the chair and I'm like, woohoo, that sounds pretty good. You know, like I made out well. Um, and then the patriarch pauses. He's like, actually, sorry, um, something went wrong. The blessing didn't record. And I didn't. Yeah, I didn't know what to make of that, but I sat back in the chair and he gave me another blessing and it was not the same. It wasn't wildly different, but all the stuff about, you know, getting married and having kids and some kind of these more um, traditional, you know, points and nothing about the travel or the education or the things that had made me so excited. Um, and so what happened is I was, I was 15, I go home and I just like, made a bullet no i really wish i would have just like, written in full sentences now but on just like a piece of scratch paper i just bulleted everything i remembered about that first blessing and then later you know a few weeks later i get the 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 second one basically the official one mailed to me and so for years i carried these two um seemingly contradictory but not necessarily contradictory just different blessings um and by the time i was feeling really restless during my first year at byu and having kind of like a lowercase r rebellion. And so I'm like, I'm going to BYU Hawaii. Um, but I really was, um, I was 19 and as naive and sad as it is to say, you know, I really was trying to reconcile um, what I felt like were two impossible ways to live. Yeah. I want to travel the world and do all these things or I need to settle down and get married. And that's how I wrongly framed it as a dichotomy in my mind. And so I, I took these two, um, two blessings to a place called the point in, in La Ye, and it's just like, beautiful, all this ocean, all the sky. And I just like, sat on this not very comfy lava rock. And I was like, okay, God, which one of these, you know, is, <laughs> is the right one. And, um, it occurred to me then, and I always have to remind myself, you know, as these lessons t tend to happen, like, it's not just, oh, something happens. And then I remember it for always. Um, but I just had this overwhelming feeling that they were both mine. Um, it was almost like my first real experience with what John Keats called negative capability and this like ability to accept uncertainties, mysteries, doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Um, and so oddly I saw the paradox was that the paradox was truer and that me wanting so desperately to be good, so desperate to see that I'm okay in the eyes of my community and my mother who still wasn't calling me, you know, there was so much I had to prove and wanted to be good. And here, like not even God was gonna give me my cosmic fortune cookie. Like they were both mine and it was up to me to forge my own life. And that to me, you know, it could be so easy to dismiss this experience as, like, oh, not inspired, here's the evidence. But for me, it was actually extremely faith promoting that um, God was, at least the way I interpret it is, is it's like, you go live your life, you know, kudos for trying. It's not the right question. Mm. Wow. Oh, that's, I love that. That's, that's yeah, it is fascinating. I'm curious if some of that, do you think some of your resistance to the idea that you were in fact sort of able to choose your own path was due to your upbringing as a Latter-day Saint woman? I know, I know that they're as opposed to, as opposed specifically to a Latter-day Saint man. And I want to get into this dynamic that you talk about too, between how you and Austin, your husband approach, uh, approach life so differently, but I, I'll let you answer that question first. Do you, th do you think there, the, a lot of that, um, a lot of that reluctance that you had to just forge ahead and trust in yourself was due to the way that women have been treated inside the Latter-day Saint tradition? You know, I think this is so individual and it depends community to community, you know, even like church building to church building. But I like I can say for me, um, I, you know, and this is a large part of my book and what I wrestle with, especially in like chapter four. Chapter four is like the hardest but like chapter to write, which is just kind of like a series of what I'd been taught explicitly and implicitly about what I felt like marriage was like the most important um, thing that I, I would ever do and that I needed to orient my whole um, life around this thing that I was skeptical of and terrified of and also wanted to be good. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, and it, it could be my upbringing and just kind of, you know, the challenges I've had, um, particularly with my mother, where I, I didn't really kind of develop that strong sense of self. Um, 
but I didn't feel particularly empowered, like even though we have all the language for it in the church of, you know, personal re revelation, um, you know, it, it just sounded like an abstract word and not actually. <laughs> and this is the thing, like if I could stand up uh, like on a platform and be like, you know, if you get anything from my book or anything for your own life, like only you are responsible um, for knowing what is good for you. No one else can know what is good for another person. And, you know, there's lots of inputs in, in kind of making that decision. But I think um, for me, and this is, you know, going back to, to Austin in the ways that we were similar and very different, where Austin um, is much more kind of traditionally faithful and just knows things with certainty. And, um, and I think for me, you know, who was very familiar with ambivalence and tension um, and, struggle and questioning and doubt i had not seen those models as positive um even though i have since gotten to a place where you know i do see that as a totally viable and even like a preferable way for me to live and that that's a good thing but i i did not grow up thinking like oh that's a that even i didn't even think i knew that was like a form of testimony um mm -hmm. and so i just kind of felt like always this dissonance of this is the thing. I want to do the thing. I want to be good. I want to fit in. Um, why, like, why can't I just get with the program, you know, yeah. and, and feeling like there was something wrong with me. And yeah. to the extent, to the extent that you now feel okay with your sort of more ambivalent and questioning and uncertain nature, what, what has made the difference for you? Has, was it travel or what, over the years, what's, what's changed? Yeah. And even travel itself is a metaphor. Like, let's be honest, we don't go anywhere and become a different person. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. Wherever you go, there you are. And so, um, you know, for, for 19 year old Rachel going somewhere and seeing something new and marveling. And, and, and I think that's what brought me to anthropology is just like seeing the infinite different ways that people live um, different from the way I had grown up was so incredible to me. Um, so, so maybe it was travel that like exposed me to these things, but I think it was more just um, getting more comfortable with just accepting like, this is this is who I am and how I inhabit my faith. There's a line at one point in my book that talks about how um, home to me almost feels like this liminal space. Um, it doesn't feel like solace, but it does feel like mine. And and this mm -hmm. and just like, this sense that uh, yeah, I I just live in a place of unease, and that's. Um, you know, for now, that's just how I inhabit the world. And, and so I might as well accept it and, and, and yeah. see the, the good. And even though I do, you know, there are times where um, I look at Austin and I, I am envious of, of that other way of inhabiting faith. But yeah, um, but it is mine. Yeah, I love this. Um, this is reminding me so much of what Richard Rohr says, that, that, that one of the one of the most important purposes of religion is to give you something to push against. Yeah. And, and it, it, that's made me think, cause I, I really experienced that socialization in a different way. I think I, I had, I didn't have so much of a restless spirit. I had, I, I, and I did relate to you a lot in that I wanted to please. I, that was just to the core. I just wanted to be able to intuit what you wanted from me and, and do it before you asked. And so I, I didn't feel anger, but I did feel like I really, I lost myself. And, but I, I appreciate that. I think I would have done that anywhere. And, and it's been, it's, this has been the laboratory to, you know, go deep in this tradition and work out those wounds. And, and so in a way, I feel like I, like I was going to have to wrestle somewhere and this is just the thing I'm going to push against to become whole. And, and I felt like we kind of got to watch you work through that. And one of the, one of my favorite parts is where you are dating this, this, so we're going to back up a little bit before you're married, you're dating this this guy I don't know if is this college or even just high school this is this is college this, this is, is college. college okay and and you have this boyfriend who sends you sister Bex talk mothers who know which <laughs> I think we all anyone near our age I'm sure really could probably has pieces of this talk memorized and it has been a really long time since I've read the talk and I I definitely heard it with different ears and it was it it, um, it was really jarring actually but could you kind of talk through that story and and talk about how you were trying to make that work at that in this season of your life yeah um you know and I and I think because I was you know at again like lowercase r rebellion but I was like you know doing weird things like I'm not wearing shoes and I only date for fun. I don't really want to get married. Am I the only one at BYU who doesn't want to get married? You know, like whatever, whatever things, but I was sneaking into like the marriage prep class and auditing it three times, you know, like there was definitely <laughs> something going on there. Um, but I think 
there was a part of me that um, wanted to believe that meeting this this person, Ethan, who I was just totally enchanted with, and we had such a connection that this was the love to prove that I was wrong, that like, I just needed to meet the right person. And now, you know, I can have what I have, like what I want, and my community can be so happy for me, and I'm doing the right thing. And so um, I think what happened is like, my desire was so strong, both in my attraction for this person, and also um, the story of what that would represent that I essentially lost myself um kind of like my true self at one point you know we had we dated for this you know cosmic amazing amazing like 31 days you know or something actually no I'll tell you it was 33 days and then I went to India <laughs> and I was I was doing field work I was doing anthropology field work for four months um leading a group of other students I had no business like leading another group of students in BYU no professor in sight but this was actually like my authentic self it was just I love to travel. I love to learn. I love to study. I love to write. Um, but it was very clear, very early, just like, oh, this is not compatible with my Ethan story. And so um, he became very stressed. And I later realized that he was going through his own faith transition. He later would come out as atheist and leave the church. Um, but he kind of started like uh, white knuckling into his own role of just, I need to be with someone who was going to be a specific kind of Mormon woman, essentially, and me wanting so much just to be with him was like, okay, I will, I will be that thing. Somehow I'll be that thing. I know I am like in, you know, all over the place in um, India, but like, basically I will, I'll grow out of that and, um, and I'll make it work. And so I got this email from him of just, I want you to read this talk um, called Mother to Know. And even reading it now, yeah, I also have a different experience and I can read it in different ways. But at the time, all I saw was a list of just like, mothers who know bring their kids to church with perfect hair and basically like mothers who know are not like restless women running around india um doing field work <laughs> um and so but rather than recognizing because i was i think so far down the path rather than recognizing like, like oh this isn't going to work um i and, and and you know maybe it's my trauma experiences of of growing up or or i think just in general not really being empowered to have a really strong core sense of self or to see that my sense of self was just as valid as you know whatever um you know group of people that this talk did resonate really powerfully for um i was just like okay yep uh, this sounds great <laughs> this sounds great Ethan. fortunately i think he he was had more of a sense of self than me and was able to call off the relationship and with distance i can see that like we were just um trying to fit roles that didn't fit us and um, but it's scary to to want to believe so much in a story and wanting to be so true. Um, but I just really promised myself, and I have to keep promising myself, I will never do that again. Um, as hard as it is, as much as I love that person, um, that that's the danger. If, if you don't, if you don't have a sense of of yourself, your own intuition, your own um, reason for why you do things, or you, you know, and again, like there's nothing wrong with any any of the women that were like described in that talk, but be, to be able to see my own experience as valid and not bad or like poor behavior um, was still something I was learning. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think a lot of people who um, have grown up within Latter-day Saints, it's a dichotomy and it's uh, it, both things are true, I think, but sometimes we internalize too much this language that we get from authority figures, from elders, right. And discount our own, and discount our own intuition but um, there's a reverse side to that too like it, not everything can be intuition and there is actual wisdom in a lot of cases to learn from authority figures or or elders the you in the part of the book where you're talking about sort of this decision to uh to get married and you're preparing you talk about um well let me just quote you you say when it came to elders there were options to choose from even within mormonism i could decide on the balance between others advice and my own intuition so i have a few questions about that but i'm curious um when you say I, it made me curious when you said i get to choose my own elders who are some of your elders or who who have been in these formative last few years yeah, thank you for that. You know, lately I've been reading so much Richard Rohr and Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, Tara Branch. You know, like these these um, these voices are really speaking to me right now. Um, I think so much, especially like since you know coming home from this trip and um, getting to just like more of a a sturdy place where I'm comfortable again with that space of unease and rather than like the crisis of just but you know just like oh this is this is um, this is me. Um, 
is I think identifying that I had a specific chasm um, in my heart to feel um, to feel and hear women's voices and women's authority, in particular, not having a very um, like clear mother figures, you know, to to uh, fill that and heavily mother became kind of something I was interested in starting at BYU and had a pretty powerful experience with that. Um, but one thing that's been really powerful for me in terms of seeing elders within my faith community that are women um, is the Exponent 2 organization. I'm the editor in chief of the Exponent 2 magazine right now currently, which is just blows my mind because this like standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, but the very first fall I came back from this trip. Um, I don't even want to call it a trip. It's just like we were on a shoestring, like <laughs> baptism by fire experience. It was so meaningful, it was so wonderful. Um, obviously, there was a book, but anyway, um, anyway, just going to this retreat. There's an annual retreat for Exponent Two, and just seeing multi, mul like multi generations, seeing women with gray and silver hair, and hearing them talk about the things that were so meaningful to them. And it was in this community and in my um, ward in Cambridge that I first met Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Um, who would be like totally uncomfortable with me fangirling her because she's just not that kind of a person. <laughs> um, but just hearing her talk and seeing the way she lived her life and just like having like literal models um, and seeing women talking and caring about the things that are also in my heart, women who also wrestle, just blew open my mind. And someone had the audacity to call me to be a gospel doctrine teacher with her for the like doctrine. Oh, oh that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds, that sounds um, intimidating. It was intimidating, um, and, but also so meaningful to be able to do that work with her. And she always had this funny slip. Um, we were talking, again, the DNC, and there was this um, kind of church companion study called uh, Revelations in Context. And Laura would always call it Revolutions in Context by accident. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yeah. Um, anyway, so she's, she's um, someone who's meant a lot to me, just a lot of those exponent women. And also even just, you know, whether it's, company and in, in, in books, I've also found a lot of kind of that love and support of like kind of an elder system in, in, in friends. And some of them are like my parents' age and some of them um, are my age, but just, yeah, just there, there's something about um, women elders that just really captivates me. <laughs> oh, I love that. And I'm, I'm always curious and I like to ask people this, but I, do you have some sort of way uh, and, and Tim kind of started talking about this but is there some way to triangulate like when you're really looking for inspiration is there one is we have we have scripture we have elders we have our own intuition or the spirit you know are you do you have some sort of way to balance all of those to recognize direction or is there one that you value over the other that is such a good question that's such a good question i think i think they're related um for me you know, one thing that was interesting in just drafting this book um, is at one point I had a reader, you know, I, I was talking about, like, oh, I don't have any intu intuition. Austin has all the intuition, you know, at least narrator Rachel saying this. And and the reader was like, that's not true. Everyone has intuition. Hers is just really buried. And so, you know, again, like constantly this work of like building fences and fences and perimeters around like, dear Rachel, you have intuition. You are capable of navigating your life, you know what's right for you. You can trust yourself. You can trust your body. You can like these things. Like still, like that's always at work. And I think that deep knowing, um, as Glenn Doyle would call it, yep. <laughs> anyway, that deep we knowing. Glenn Doyle. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, cheese was Buddha. Yeah, so this this deep knowing, I think, is divine and it's inherent. Like we have that. Um, and so I think learning to balance that um, intuition that's just kind of like my God given desires and interests and capabilities, I think it is a little bit different than what we talk about with the spirit, though. Um, mm. To me, like there is just like the slightest differentiation, although it's still the muscle of learning to trust oneself and to have that personal experience yeah. and, and to trust it. Um, but I think for me, it's reminding me of Matthew Wickman's um, recent spiritual member, Life to the Whole Being. Um, he actually calls this like the spirit as like a gentle irony. Um, and the quote in the title from his book comes from a quote from Parley P. Pratt describing the Holy Ghost's infinite array of manifestations. And so Wickman uses words like um, divine shadow and kinetic energy, you know, just like these like very surprising um ways of talking about the spirit and i think yeah so i think if intuition is this deep given knowing um 
I think the spirit is this sense of surprise or bewilderment or, you know, whether that's ge that gentle irony or something, something surprising, some, something like sometimes when I, you know, read a, a book or something that moves me or have a prompting. And so I think th those two things together are really foundational and really powerful. Um, if one can but learn to trust them and listen to them. Mm. That's so <laughs> interesting. interesting. We, we just talked, or you may, are you going to, this is where you're going to, like we just Go talked ahead. to Richard Bushman and he said, the way he talked about that, he said, I think sometimes the spirit speaks through intrusion and sometimes it's through infusion. And I think infusion, he was saying, it's something that is coming through your own faculties. It's your own mind, your own gut. And I like the idea that they're coming from the same voice, you know, that it's the same voice of God that we're connecting to. And so I, so this is super interesting, but, I, and I'd also be curious to know, so do you feel like, I think a lot of women especially have this resistance toward developing a sense of self because it, it kind of looks like selfish things, <laughs> you know, it looks like knowing what you want and asking for it. It can, it can look like that. And so can you just talk about like, how is that related? How has developing a sense of self connected to recognizing the voice of God? I think one thing that was important when I was writing this um, in general, and I don't know if this is a direct answer or not, but one thing that just became really meaningful to me is recognizing so many of the stories and scripts that, um, you know, were given to me. I was also like feeding myself. There's a point in the book where I wanted to be a writer all my life. I've always wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't sure that that was a real job. And who was I? Da, 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 da. So I'm on the Camino de Santiago, which is a 500 mile pilgrimage uh, through Spain. It's the last third of the book. It's my favorite part of the book um, because Mine I start too, to actually. realize so many of the questions I'm asking in my obsession about marriage. I'm starting starting to realize that it's not about marriage. It's about bigger questions, and uh, you know, and we'll talk about those. But what is happiness? What is success? You know, all this. But um, so I met a, I met a friend named Kim on this on this pilgrimage, and this is a place where you have time for the long version of a story with a person. It's a very sacred experience to have that kind of time with with a stranger, essentially. And Kim happened to be a writer, and she saw how much I wanted to be a writer and how much I wanted to own that. Um, and this is what I write. This is um, in chapter twenty three. I say, who was I? to claim I had a story worth telling, let alone the confidence to tell it. A 20-something millennial, know-nothing married Utah Mormon girl. But then I remembered the bitter small place where that thinking came from. That story wasn't true. That story wasn't true for anyone. That story had never been true. And I think once I started to realize, you know, looking around for all of those those forms and scripts of just, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. This is the plan. Like literally no one is the plan. Everyone is an individual on their own private journey. And and once I could recognize that there wasn't like the version or the right way and everyone was just navigating this for themselves, that like those stories aren't true. There's no, just no, nothing stupid Utah Mormon girl. Like that's not real. Um, then I think I, I could start to allow myself to see that my, seemingly not as traditional ways of being were not bad or in violation of something because the standard itself is kind of an illusion mm. wow yeah that's really interesting well I, sort of along those lines i want to just jump back a little bit though and say okay we've we've drawn at least a subtle distinction between the spirit and intuition or, or deep knowing potentially um but i want to draw another distinction and get your thoughts on it between deep knowing and just the sort of everyday thoughts and feelings that we have. And, and I, I'm speaking sort of as a person that's um, struggled with with OCD. Um, one of the first things I learned in therapy was feelings aren't facts. Because what you do, like in this really black and white kind of uh, state is you have an intrusive thought or a compulsive need to do something or whatever. And you take that as absolute fact. And it feels like if you don't follow whatever that thing is, then the world's going to fall apart or something terrible is going to happen. And so there's something very different, I think, between those types of thoughts and feelings, which can lead you really, really wrong, and this and this deep knowing. So how I don't know if the, I don't know if you can relate to that, but I'm curious if you've thought about this at all. And like, how would you distinguish between if, if we're talking about you know, two internal processes potentially, one deep knowing, one is just like a thought that could totally lead you astray. How do you how do you tell the difference between those things? 
Thank you for sharing your personal experience. Yeah, this is this is definitely something I've I've struggled with. I have pretty severe generalized anxiety, and you know, and and much of the book too. I mean, it already is a little bit like this is a very anxious person going about in the world. But you know, even some of the anxiety is not in there. I trim some out, believe it wow. or not. But, um, but yeah, um, I do struggle, and I think I think the key thing for me is I can tell the difference of is this a deep place of knowing versus um, a reaction is if it's fear-based. Um, right. Am I acting out of fear? And guess what? I act out of fear all the time. You know, that's the, like, oh no, someone's mad at me. Or um, I've recently like, got some language. Like, I almost imagine like a game piece that you like flick the little arrow and it goes around. And I've since realized like the trauma, like response to trauma isn't just like fight or flight. It's also appease and freeze. And it's like, okay, wow. where am I? <laughs> where am I on this? And if I'm on it, then it means uh, the metaphor I've been using lately is like the pilot light, my personal pilot light, that pilot light of knowing of groundedness of a, a deeper sense of self, my best self. Um, sometimes it's a little flicker, sometimes it's roaring, or am I like on the game piece? Um, and the game piece wow. definitely has lots of thoughts and feels of what I should be doing at any given day. But I think the knowing comes from more of the pilot light side of things. So wow. I really Gosh, like Rachel. metaphors. So what do you do when you feel like that pilot lights out or you can tell that you're in like full appease mode or full, like just react, reacting out of fear. How do you get that back in the moment? I, I've lately just like practice resourcing. I love, oh gosh, Thomas McConkie and his mindfulness plus podcast. Like that is a daily godsend for me. Yeah. Um, just like company, uh, whether that's like the elders we talked about, friends or reading folks like mm -hmm. Richard Rohr, you know, just kind of grounding on myself. But mostly it's, it's honestly just like planting my feet on the ground and finding something sturdy, whether it's that texture of the carpet or uh, my breath or, you know, a sound something and just trying to ground myself and to remind myself like, I'm not in like mortal danger. I am safe. I have everything that I need. I am capable. I'm just trying to resource. I'm not always good at that. Um, yeah. And sometimes, sometimes things just like suck and it takes a while for those to work out. But at least for making like big decisions, which I still super struggle with, um, you know, n like recognizing like, am I acting out of fear, which is the game piece, um, yeah. has just been a helpful metric to at least have language to even chart myself on the map of how I'm behaving and what I'm doing. Yeah. And you know, it's so interesting all through the book. I mean, you actually do have some of those mortal danger moments. Like you have yes. moments where like fear is the appropriate surging emotion. And, and it was amazing to see. And, and maybe you want to tell the story that's coming to mind is, is the one about the dogs in the Amazon. I couldn't believe this is real life. Will you just tell that story? And I wonder if you had time to think and really process how different did it feel to actually be in danger versus what I'm experiencing day to day when I know I'm not in danger, but I'm feeling the, my body is reacting like I'm, I'm, I'm in that same kind of danger. Oh yeah. So many, so many great questions. It's like, I can identify, oh yeah, that's one of the most afraid feelings I've ever like felt in my life. But I also recognize yeah. because of my anxiety disorder, people would talk about the relief after finals week. I'd be like, literally, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, you know, so it is interesting though, and this does tie back to kind of, I think this question of instinct and knowing as well. The story basically is, this is, this is chapter five. <laughs> um, Austin and I are having a huge issue with, uh, bas basically we've, we've crossed a border illegally. We are in Peru illegally and we are essentially um, getting deported, having major relationship stresses, language barriers. I thought my Spanish was a lot better than it was. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we're, we're in another country illegally and we have to find our way back. And w w at that point, we're trying to save money because we've, I've, anyway, the, the details don't matter so much for this context, but essentially what happened is we had the great idea of we're going to walk back to the boat that's going to take us 15 hours back to this Columbia area. It was the bad time, but the, the worst of the bad time was we're walking in the dark. It's the middle of the night. Um, we're in the middle of the Amazon jungle and uh, we start hearing dogs barking and we st uh, slowly start to realize like we are in their territory. They are circling us. They are attacking us. And my response as, you know, what is similar to other things in my life, I'm a runner. Um, I'm a shrieker. I'm a runner. I'm like, get me out of here. Um, and Austin's more the stand and fight kind of a person. Um, and he just had this, this intuition that if he had, his, his headlamp, just these little target headlamps that we just happened to have with him. And he sh shined it in the dog's eyes, like a wolf and torches. 
that somehow this would bite, make them not bite us. And so we're slowly making our way through their territory and he's doing this. And again, my impulse is to run, which is going to get me eaten by these dogs. My family doesn't know where I have. I have no health insurance. This is a bad time. Um, and, you know, he grabs my wrist and he's like, don't run. They will chase you if you run. And he just knew. He just had this instinct. Um, and eventually, somehow, we, we make it to the dock. My heart is hammering a thousand miles an hour. And I just look at him and I am this like this whole time I've been like thinking, who did I marry? Who does he think he married? But I asked him, like, how did you know to do that? And he did, he, and he didn't know. And I think for similar reasons, like we I can't fully necessarily know why we do something. Like there was, there was a part of me that chose him and wanted to be with him outside of all these scripts and pressures, and like that. It's almost, almost deeper than even to intuition, or it's like not a conscious intuition. Um, you know, sometimes there's just something instinctual um, that can't be accounted for in that way. But um, yeah, I um, love that story though because. I want to believe that we always have the strength that we need in in the moment that we need it, you know, like that that's the worst thing I can imagine in the middle of a dark forest. But also I love that you you can handle it. You can always handle it in the moment. And and that gives me peace in the middle of anxiety. Trusting that all these things that I'm afraid are going to happen, I can at least trust that when when they come, then I'll be able to deal with it. Oh, like in the instant that we need it, there's something bigger that that comes to us and that makes us able to do the hardest thing totally and when we're having that response like when i have to stand up and say my name in a fun fact and i feel like a lion is chasing me i can like <laughs> gently talk to myself and be like you are not currently being attacked i know that your body is acting perfectly and like trying to keep you safe but like you're not being attacked and just to gently you know not in yeah. a mean way but you know just try to try to resource again so yeah. yes well, let me let me shift gears just a little bit and ask you about a section of the book that I found it really interesting. Um, in, it's when you're talking about your actual sealing when you're being sealed to Austin in the in the temple, and you write, um, "I do remember the miracle that nothing had seriously offended me. A better outcome than a typical Sunday at church." And that I felt like it's just like a little. You just kind of slip it in there. This is very much not a church is hard book at all. Um, but I think. You probably, for a lot of readers like me, I grabbed onto that and said, oh, we definitely share something in common because a lot of people, I think that listen to this podcast or have read your book probably have felt at least a period of time in which church is really, really hard. Um, and a time when it's difficult to go to a sacrament meeting without feeling offended by something. So I wanted to ask you, um, I wanted to ask you about that, about that feeling. Has anything changed since then? At the time of your ceiling, uh, you're you're implying at least that, that there were these really hard moments almost every, every week at church. Um, what's has anything has anything changed, or do you keep going and been there? You're finding something deeper, or what's could could you just give us a little bit of insight? Sure, and I, yeah, I hope I hope I <laughs> I hope I'm changed. You know, certain things actually you know have gotten have gotten harder, but I think especially when I was first having my my faith crisis, which I I prefer to call just kind of like a certainty crisis. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I would, I would just walk around in despair and look at the trees and just be like, what is keeping the leaves on the trees? Just like total existential, mm. um, <laughs> like paralysis. And I think now, you know, um, and, you know, again, maybe it's just like having more of a sense of self um, and just knowing more what I'm about and what I believe. People can say things and I can register it differently. It doesn't feel like a full on assault of of everything and i recognize that i'm very privileged i um i live in cambridge massachusetts and i have a very open-minded ward where i see a spectrum of experiences honored all the time we have mormon atheists who bear their testimony we have um the first gay couple married in utah that are in my ward um you know like there's there's also you know people who are like at the other end of the spectrum and um similar to what i love about exponent i just feel like there's there's a respect um, or at least the attempt of deep respect of knowing like there people in this room are going to um, see things differently and you have to you have to reckon with that 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 difference it's not just homogenous in that way so i feel really good about that it doesn't mean that i'm always like woohoo um i often leave very drained um but i really appreciate you know going back to laurel thatcher ulrich she has a quote about how she says the church i believe in is not an ascending hierarchy of the holy the church I believe in is millions of people calling one another brother and sister and trying to make it true. And I think for wow. me, like the ward unit and just like the actual people I interact with, some who are like think wildly different things from me, sometimes wildly offensive things from me. Um, but um, 
really learning to sit with that. That to me is the most like valuable part of the instant institutional church for me right now. And so, yeah, I, I go and I'm very grateful for that, even though it's not like the most like necessarily like spiritually nourishing always, there is still something really beautiful about that struggle. And, and I learn and grow from that too. Oh, thank you. Um, there's another crazy story that I'd love for you to tell. I think it's from when you're in Thailand, but I'm not actually positive. It's about the tattoo. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're, we're still just a few months in figuring it out and um, we're, we're eating lunch in a restaurant and a, a drunk dude just like comes stumbling, running through the open air restaurant, being ch pursued and chased by um, someone threatening to take this drunk dude to jail. And and Austin's impulse again, I'm I'm like shrink, flight, fight, response. I'm like conflict, run away. He stands up and is like, "What's going on?" <laughs> um, and so you know, it, it turned out it was a traditional bamboo parlor guy trying to make money, run a business, and he gives um, a tattoo to um, a blackout drunk um, Swiss guy. And the Swiss guy has no money; can't really even remember his name. He's since locked himself in the bathroom of the restaurant. And Austin's like, "I'm going to go talk to him." Um, and, and what it brought up is just, I think, like the difference in judgment Austin and I sometimes um, exhibited and also um, how we both feel about money because Austin ultimately fronted the money for the bamboo <laughs> uh, tattoo, which was a terrible tattoo. It was just two <laughs> like thin circles around the guy's nipples. I mean, awful. No one pay, no one would pay for that tattoo. Um, <laughs> I wonder, Austin, like, I guess. <laughs> Austin, what, Austin <laughs> yeah. paid for the tattoo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, just, you know, as we both kind of learn to appreciate, like we do, we inhabit these situations so differently. And I grew up with um, food scarcity and money scarcity and Austin didn't. And, um, but just learning to see, you know, some, sometimes these things um, just happen and like in a moment it shows and exposes all those differences. Yeah. Um, but I think one thing that I was tempted to do for years actually after the story is magically somehow um, the drunk guy scribbled his name and email on like a piece of toilet paper or something. And he like, gave it to Austin <laughs> to reach out for the money when he had it. And I was like, oh, we're never going to see that money again. And the guy did. The guy sent us the money back. And, and so for a really long time, it was like, oh, Austin knew best. And I'm glad I was wrong. It took me a little bit longer to realize my reaction was also fair. Austin should talk to me about these things. Like we were both right and we were both wrong in how we, in how yeah. we dealt with that. So... I love that story because you, you kind of, you almost hear this. I mean, you're, you're, you're seeing the story through your eyes, but, but it's still kind of a simple version first. And then you get home and you, so you leave, you leave the restaurant angry oh, yeah. and, I'm a and run home. Yeah. Ouch. Run home. And then you kind of have this time to really reflect and, and you write, you write, maybe I shouldn't have run off like that. That's something my mother would have done. Wasn't it time to advocate for myself to listen and talk through difficult things? And I just, I wanted to like sit with that chapter for a little bit because I, I totally resonated with that. I understand the feeling of having a gut reaction that totally makes sense. That is the product of your experience and your personality, your genes. It's just, it's just the, the thing that you, that you are. And then having this moment of real agency to decide, is this who I want to be? And, and so I it was just, I want to hear how this process of writing the whole memoir was for you did did it give you this moment over and over where you could pause and say do I choose this because it just feels like when we're not mindful about these really painful moments like I love that Brene Brown she calls this chandelier pain where you just have no choice but to react big because it hurts so much and and in the in the book we're privy to all of these really painful experiences that you had with your own mom that of course they would be part of you and so at moments I was like, I, we have no agency. There's no agency here. You're just a product of the hard things that happen to you and who you are. But then over and over, you would have these pauses where you would choose something else. So I just want to, I just want to hear like your perspective about that. What was this therapeutic to just constantly be processing what happened and what you want to choose anyway? And how can those of us who are not going to write a memoir take this, this healing this thing that feels like it would be really healing in, into like normal life. Yeah. I'm like, everyone, everyone write a book. Yeah. No, I can't even necessarily <laughs> recommend it. I mean, I had to write this book, but it was hard. And sometimes that's therapeutic in a good way. And sometimes it's just like crying at the keyboard. Um, but I think one thing that's really helpful, you know, in, in terms of having a structure for writing is always the first draft you write is the what happened draft um, or, or usually. So I got back from this trip. I immediately wrote some semblance of a draft that maybe three, maybe 
0.5% is still in this final book, wow. you know, but it was like, this is, this is the what happened draft. Um, and then I had years to really look and look and look and, um, ha and, and make the, what did it mean draft and the, what did it mean draft, whether we're literally writing a book or looking at our own lives of, you know, whether it's those points of trauma or there's that, you know, are just at us acting out on the trauma response game piece, yeah. <laughs> um, that we're trying to change, trying to like, like you can't move a mountain necessarily, but you can move a river over time with a lot of work. And that's. That's how I think about it a lot, but um, I I think it's just helpful to know that as important as stories are, and as important as even the origin story was for me, and to make sense of this life, my one life that I have, um, the what it means changes. And this book, you know, yes, I wrote it eight years after the fact, and it has a certain meaning and many meanings that I layered in and really resonate with me. If I would have written this memoir um or kept working on it for another eight years it would mean something different too mm. um you know even now you know even even how i relate to travel as someone who's really worried about climate crisis or you know even certain stories um you know the thing with the dogs you know sometimes i'm still just wait what <laughs> um you know and it, it can mean something different than necessarily just what's on the page but that's okay like stories um you know serve their function but it's really meaningful though to, to do yeah. that work and to excavate um those events and probe them a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get, I want to um, make sure that our listeners have a chance to hear a little bit of this, of this book and how beautiful the writing is. You're, I, I truly think that you're a remarkable writer and I'm excited that our faith tradition has uh, an up and coming young person like you who's, who's capable of doing work like this. And so if it's okay, I would love to do a reading or, or two. Which one are you thinking, Aubrey, first? I was thinking suffering is currency first. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm. Suffering is currency. Okay. 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 So this is page 232. Okay. All right. Somehow, somewhere along the way in my life, I had internalized the subconscious idea of suffering is currency, a necessary means to any end. I had to earn happiness. The harder the struggle, the bigger the payoff, the more valiant, the short-lived triumph. Without pain, how could I afford or justify my undeserved joy without identifying closely with past trauma, the tissue thin jeans from middle school, the sound the key made when I couldn't turn it in the lock of my childhood home anymore, the taste of village and waffles with my dad and Lisa instead of the family Thanksgiving dinner I wasn't invited to all the times I left church crying or had my heart broken for not being Mormon enough. A student throwing a desk across my classroom, my mother's humiliated eyes in the psychiatric ward, my anxiety about marriage. Who was I? Resilience became an identity, a war medal. This scarcity mindset taught me that everything good was rare, a lucky blip of pleasure. Sooner or later, the happiness would run dry. I'd be sucked down into my boring, familiar misery again. To expect another hit of delight? Ludicrous. I love this because I think that as Latter-day Saints, <clears throat> we could read our history in a way that would actually kind of reinforce this idea that suffering is sanctifying. I think suffering can be sanctifying, but it feels like we hit something problematic when we start trying to stay in this suffering place and, and pushing away joy because we feel like it's like we almost don't even know how to just let it all in. In the next paragraph, you talk about drinking deeply from satisfaction, I think is your phrase. And maybe this is a Latter-day Saint issue. Maybe this is just our own personalities and childhoods. But talk about how your feelings about suffering as currency have evolved since you since you really wrestled with this concept. Yeah, I think I just wrongly assumed that for life to have meaning, it had to be filled with suffering. That suffering was actually the ingredient that brought meaning. And, you know, we obviously um, have a tradition with the pioneers, which, you know, is both, both sides of my family. But I also think in my own um, childhood, for me to just um, grieve my childhood, grief without meaning, that was just not something I was capable of doing for a really long time. And so it had to be like, oh, it all happened for a reason. I had to do this so I could become really resilient. And then all, you know, just so almost formulaic of, yeah, the harder life is, the more um, important and meaningful it is. But I'm, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to strip out the not necessary hard stuff. Life is already hard. Life is already hard. I don't think God wants it to be harder for us. Um, and so I think, yeah, that sanctifying of, 
um, you know, and it, it can go even farther feeling like perpetually like a martyr is not, um, again, it's, it's not, I think, acting from our truest best self. I think it's reacting from um, what we know to be familiar and not necessarily who we want to be. So would you say that you still see suffering as sort of necessary? I, I, I ask because I guess a lot of the growth that I've experienced over my, you know, over my time starting as a young person to where I am now has been due to suffering, whether it be, like I mentioned, OCD or whether it's parenting or, you know, difficulties with, with stuff of, in my career or whatever. And, and especially I would say my faith journey, that's probably like number one, but I feel like the person I am now is largely due to suffering. And so I'm wondering, is the point you're making, like, we don't need to purposely add suffering in order to add meaning? Like, we'll, we, we'll get, we'll get what we need anyway, or what would you, how would you frame it? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think there's any way to eliminate suffering in life. And we do, of course, grow from that. I think what I was really caught in is not realizing that you can find many, like meaning in other places, like joy or reveling in a child or, um, you know, beauty or, you know, just these other things that I think I always knew were meaningful, but somehow felt like 3% as powerful as really identifying with my trauma. Um, which was real and of course forged me. But I think, um, you know, just in general, the, the, the more clear metaphor when I'm doing this grueling 500 mile pilgrimage across Spain is at one point, it is so bad that I literally like, what am I doing? And I think that's the point we really have to be careful of. Are we mindful about what we're doing and something that's really meaningful, like raising a child or writing a book, you know, these things that are hard. Um, it's not just that they're hard that's made it meaningful, you know, it's that there's there's something really important here. There's something that we really care about, but just suffering for the sake of suffering um, without being mindful about why we're doing that, I think is just perpetuating, at least in my own life experience, um, these old narratives that I'm just playing out over and over again, because the harder I work and the more I suffer, somehow the greater the reward will be, which is just not always the case. Yeah. Beautiful. I think, I think it was Thomas McConkie on an episode once that talked about holding your life with an open fist, like an, a, a palm that can open and close and open and close. And for me, that's kind of what I took for about the, in this suffering conversation in your book, that maybe the idea is suffering is okay and joy is okay. It takes so much work to be able to open our hands to that and let things come and go to do a season of suffering and then to really be willing to be peaceful and feel joy because it's it, it almost feels like we just we have this momentum and it's hard to shift and believe that it's okay to be unequivocally happy. And, and then maybe we'll lose it tomorrow, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be happy today, you know, and this mm -hmm. idea that it's, it's changing. That's the hard thing. It's almost easier to just stay in one mode <laughs> and, and this being in limbo and the uncertainty it comes back to that uncertainty. That's the thing that is so hard, but it's also what makes our life so beautiful and rich. Yeah. And yeah. That image of the hand opening and closing is really beautiful. And I think, um, what it reminds me of the part where I, um, so at one point, you know, so after having that first sort of realization with um, this is really hard and I don't know why I'm doing it, which is kind of the scary place to be. Eventually, I get to a place where I ask myself, um, who would I be without fearing the wrath of failure? If I wasn't afraid, who was I? If I wasn't sad, where was life's meaning? If I wasn't the accumulation of all the hard things I had faced and overcome, how would I measure the value of my life? And I think for me, that's the distinction because we go through hard things. Everyone goes through hard things, um, but we are divine beings. You know, I am not just just any of these labels or any of these experiences or, you know, sometimes I I get really wrapped up in knots where I identify too closely with like my, my unruly faith journey. These are things I experience. It's not who I am. I am, I am so much um, bigger than just what I've done through and who I am. We, we're, we're of course shaped by the accumulation of these experiences, but um, that that knowing, that core divine spark of who we are is always there, regardless of what we've done or what we're going to do or if we're being good. Um, and so that's the part that I think I needed to get in touch with more. Yes. Yeah, I really love that. If you look yeah. back at the, as we kind of wrap up, like you look back at Rachel in the Amazon <laughs> at the very beginning of this trip and all of the fears and the newness of marriage. And then, and then fast forward to the end of your year where you're you're kind of watching this last sunset before you go home in Spain can you just talk about how your your understanding and 
what you expected and were afraid of about marriage evolved over the over this whole book? For me, it was learning to see that my sense of self, my selfness, like was not dying by getting married, that I was a continuation of who I was. Austin and I were a continuation um, and that I would never be giving up choice. I had not sold my soul. I had not lost who I was. And that partnership was a choice, um, always a choice. And so I think giving up that faith and certainty and my unruly relationship with that for faith in the day-to-day -day choice of partnership, um, something that you know gives me a little bit more responsibility and is also more individual. You know, one of the great ironies, I've gone all around the world asking people what marriage means to them. And I still like still hadn't fully looked inward and asked myself, what does marriage mean? Not what my culture says marriage is, not what Austin would say uh, marriage is, but what do I think marriage is? Um, and that's what I came to. It was just the, the daily choice. It was something I could make peace with. I didn't have to know how it would work out forever and ever. And eternity is still a very daunting process. I don't know if I want to live in a place where the toast isn't burned. That sounds really weird. Um, but like, I knew I wanted to be with Austin that day and maybe the next day, you know, and so just taking it step by step, very much like the Camino metaphor. That's so beautiful. I love that. And I would love to end there. Could you do another reading um, just to kind of close this out? Yes. Maybe, maybe Rachel, you could frame sort of like meeting this yeah. artist and then your reflections in that following paragraph. Yeah, that's great. That's okay. great. Yeah. So um, we're, we weren't prepared for almost any part of this journey. We were truly <laughs> just like winging it in like the worst of senses on the shoestring budget again. Um, but we really knew we wanted to see Europe and we were running out of money, but we wanted to do it meaningfully. And so we decided to do this pilgrimage. But we showed up in jeans and sandals. I mean, truly didn't know what we were getting into, but we met this really nice man um, who kind of looked us up and down and recognized us as fellow pilgrims. And he was the first one who told us um, Buen Camino. And this is, this is what he says to us. Buen Camino, he said, good way or have a good way. Hearing that phrase for the first time gave me pause, like observing myself on the stage of a fatalistic epic drama unsure of my role, let alone my level of commitment to play it out. I'd grown weary of roles, others' roles. I'd carried the notion of good around for so long. The singular why implied one path, one direction, which I would developed a kind of allergy toward. But the way was less a literal path and more the personal individual variety. No one else could forge your way for you. No one else could evaluate whether or not it qualified as good besides you. All they could offer were good wishes on your solitary journey. Buen Camino. The phrase sounded kind of beautiful too. I love that. I love that. I love that part. I love, and this last third of the book, like you said, I think you said is your favorite. It was also, it was also my favorite. And it made me actually, it made me want to go to Spain and try this, but I, based on your description, I wasn't actually sure I could do it. So just don't wear sandals in the yeah. snow in the Pyrenees and you're going to be fine. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I wanted to know how you, how you think about this sort of singular way versus individualized way, especially in the context of our faith tradition and in the context of this new phrase that sort of sprung up in the past six or seven years, which is the covenant path. And I think it's, it could be easy to hear the covenant path as a singular way, you know, it's stay on the covenant, covenant path, meaning go in the way that's uh, sort of like previously been forged for mm -hmm. you. Um, but is there another way, is there another way to hear that? And do you hear it in a, in a different way? Yeah, I think that's related. I mean, and growing up, it was always like the iron rod, the narrow path. And I always thought this is a narrow path. This is a narrow way to live. But I've since come to realize it's narrow because you're the only one on it. <laughs> um, like it is your it is your path. And so to me, the phrase Buen Camino, it's 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 a sacred phrase. And um, to me, it's almost like the word sonder, a noun that means the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own. And I think similar to what I brought up earlier of just realizing like this narrative I had about those good Utah Mormon girls that I was not was like also not real. Um, you know, and I think namaste is another one of these, you know, similar as like a buen camino, but I think it's recognizing that we live and learn in communities. Um, like I brought up with my own war experience, but that the spiritual life while informed by these is individual 
um, one of my favorite quotes by the poet Rilke um, describes love as two solitudes that protect and border and salute each other. And, and like, to me, like that is Buen Camino. It's like, I see you, I'm on this journey, you're on this journey. Thank you for sharing this, you know, whether we're walking for two hours or 33 days together, um, you know, thank you for your company. And I recognize that your journey, while it might seemingly look similar to mine is not. Um, and so I, I've started to be brave and like sign my emails off with Buen Camino because oh, I, I, love, lo I love the phrase so much. Um, yeah. But yeah, trying to, trying to live it. So. Oh my gosh. What a beautiful place to end. Thank you so much, Rachel, we, for the book and for this conversation. We're just so excited for everybody to go have this experience that we had reading it. Yeah. Thank and you. let me ask you too, Rachel, just before we sign off, where's, the, where's the best place to, to get this book? Um, it sounds like there's an audio book as Aubrey and I read the text, but there's an audio book as well. Did you record that or? I did. Yeah. Okay. I took my whole heart and soul. I did the audio book. Yeah. The book is available on paperback and hardcover wherever books are sold. Um, you know, Kindle, independent bookstores, um, all that good stuff. And yeah. always appreciate, yeah, especially for the small fry writers. This is my debut book. If you like the book, tell me, write a review. Just, um, I'm so grateful to share this book. It's, it's the most communal, most personal book I think I will ever write. And I hope I will write more books, but I mean, oh, so and for yeah. for a for a debut, I mean, I'm a I'm sort of an Amazon review junkie, and reading the reviews, I don't I don't think I've ever seen as enthusiastic a crowd as those so who true, are who, who are reviewing your book. And I felt I felt the same way. I'm just I'm just excited that you're part of our tradition. I think this yeah, is yeah, we're proud to claim you. Tradition. Yeah, if that's okay. <laughs> so kind. This is one of my favorite podcasts, and I'm just so honored uh -oh. to um, to have shared this book with you. And thank you for reading, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for listening, and we really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Rachel Rukert. Again, you can grab a copy of her book, East Winds, at Amazon or Barnes & Noble online. A huge thanks to Rachel for coming on the show. And if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. It really helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.